Good morning, Village Church. How are we feeling today? Oh, yeah. Okay, let's stand up. I know y'all braved the rain to get here, and we're going to rock out. We've got Trisha. Give a big warm welcome to Trisha this morning. And William on the drums. And our good old friend Alejandro up here. So let's all do this. This is called Hold Us Together. So we are so lucky to have Trisha as a member of our house. And a couple weeks ago, yes, we celebrated our 30th anniversary as a church, as the Village Church, uh, under Ray's leadership. And Trisha actually wrote a song that kind of captures who we are as a congregation. So whether you're standing or sitting, will you sing Welcome Home with us and know that these words are specific to this place?
why don't you have a seat real quick? We're going to talk about uh, our values here at the village. We believe that love is who God is and that God calls us to love all people. We also believe in generosity. And so if you have a, a heart for giving, we want to provide a place for you to give of your time, talent, or treasure. And uh, Rachel Northrup's going to be in the back if you want to give. But this next song is called Graves into Gardens. And I think it's so beautiful. A lot of people in this room have been on a faith journey. Uh, that maybe has called us to transform something old into something new. And this song really speaks to that. So please sing with us. So when he turns beauty into ashes, when Mother God turns amazingly terrible things into good things, 
we see the beauty all around us. I think a lot of people believe this world is just broken and fallen and terrible, and our goal is to just get out of here as soon as possible. But we know, even on rainy days like today, that there's beauty all around us. So we want you to take some time. We always want to make sure we have time at the village just to reflect uh, whether for you that looks like breathing, meditating, praying. We just want to create space for you to see the beauty around you and just sit for a moment and be present. I think all week we're rushing, we're thinking about the next thing. But let's just think about beautiful things for a couple minutes today.
dear Lord, we thank you uh, for all of your goodness, for all the beauty in the world and for all that we have around us that is good. Uh, we pray, Lord, that today we would be together as a community, as a family, and that you would bless the words that we're about to hear, that they would resonate somewhere deep within us that has been asleep for quite a while. In Jesus' name. So there's one more song I forgot. You know, this always happens as a worship leader. Could you all join me? Because it was Pastor Ray's birthday this week. Happy birthday. Welcome, Pastor Ray. Thank you all very, very much. It was a wonderful birthday. I was 61, and um, 60, 50 was the worst. That was the, I don't know why 50 was bad, but 60 was good, 61 better, and uh, I'm so excited. We had a lovely day, and uh, I just feel smarter and wiser, and um, I'm really happy about that. Thank you all for being excited to see you. Matt, the music was terrific. Um, Tricia, I love your song. That's so good. And we are so glad that you've ch chosen to be, especially on today, that you are going to love. Um, let me just mention a couple of things. David Hood, um, Marsha's husband, Kylie Joe's dad, uh, he was taken to the hospital this morning, and so I said we'd let everybody know, and you'll be praying for David. They don't know yet what's going on, but uh, just having some health issues, so please pray. And then our Jim Baum that we love so much, and he's been having some rough days, but Jim Baum is going to get an MRI tomorrow. And so let's just all be praying with Jim and just let him know that we are standing in solidarity with him as he's going through this, this rough time. And then Jeffrey is back after his uh, brain surgery. So Jeffrey, we're so glad that you are back. It's, it's good to see everybody. I'm sorry, I'm praying for Lynn because Jeffrey's back and Jeffrey needs a little, little TLC. That's right. That's right. Hey, next week is Father's Day. We're going to have a great Father's Day service with a surprise. Well, I'll go ahead and tell you, Matthew Paul Turner is a wonderful children's author of books and a great, great guy. And he's going to be sharing some in our service next week. So you're going to want to be here for that. It'll be really good. Well, I first met Paula Williams at a Wild Goose. And I was blown away. I was blown away at the way she preached. I was just blown away with her. And then I picked her up at the airport last night, and Jane and I just laughed and had the best time with Paula till about 12:30 in the morning. And I'm so I'm so excited that she's speaking today. She's a wonderful preacher. She speaks on gender equity all over the world. She has over nine million views on TED on her TED talks, which is a little more than I've ever had on a the Village page by about 9 million. It's amazing. And uh, she's going to be preaching this morning. Would you give a warm Village welcome to Paula Stone Williams? Thank you. Thank you. So we were on vacation in Canada. I was looking forward to going fishing with my three brothers in law. And John and I were the first to get in our boat. And we started rowing up the St. Lawrence River. We weren't making a lot of progress, though. The wind was against us. On the other hand, we were definitely making more progress than my other two brothers-in-law in their boat. David was rowing just as hard as he possibly could row, but it looked to me like he wasn't going anywhere at all. The fact of the matter was, David was not going anywhere at all. He was still tied to the dock rowing for all he's worth, trying to pull all of Canada behind him. You know, what made it even better, he was a university president. You know, and you're just seeing this, you know, university president just, and I, you know, we laughed so hard, just about turned our boat over. <laughs> Funny things happen in boats. It's always been intriguing to me that some of the most important lessons ever learned in Scripture were lessons learned when people were riding in boats. And yes, that's right, you guessed it. This morning, we're going to talk about some of those stories because important lessons are learned in boats. Our first boat story comes from the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Jesus had just completed eight mini parables. He was ready to head back across the Sea of Galilee. He got in the back of the boat. The disciples got in the front of the boat. They headed across the Sea of Galilee. And 
Jesus is sound asleep and a terrible storm kicked up just like that, which as I understand it is not all that unusual in the Sea of Galilee, only this storm was worse than usual. The waves are crashing against the bow of the boat. The wind is whistling through the boat and the disciples thought, well, this, this is it. We're going to die right here in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And they look at the back of the boat and there is Jesus sound asleep. Don't you hate it? When someone can be completely and utterly calm, when you are convinced the world is ending? So, you know, a number of years ago, I was kayaking off the coast of Long Island, New York, where I lived at the time, and I was with one of my good friends, and it was late November, but one of those really, really warm fall days off of Long Island, and so we were in our kayaks headed across the Great South Bay to one of our favorite lagoons on the other side. But we got about 50 yards away from that lagoon, and we both got hit by a trailing wave, which turned both of our kayaks over just like that. Now, we had really, really stable kayaks, which means once they go over, you are not spinning them back up. You have no option but to do a wet exit. Now, to do a wet exit, you've got to pull up on the spray skirt, push yourself out of the kayak like you're taking off a pair of pants, and doing all of this while you're upside down under the water. And did I mention, it was the middle of November. And we hadn't worn our wetsuits because, you know, it was a warm day, but that water was so cold. I finally get back to the surface. I am sure we're going to die right in the middle of the Great South Bay. I am flapping my arms. I'm desperate trying to swim back to shore. And my friend said, Paula, Paula, stand up. Yeah, sure enough, water was about four feet deep. <laughs> Just kind of pulled the boat back to the shore. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on here. The disciples are feeling terrified. Jesus is sound asleep in the back of the boat. They wake him up, not because they think he can do anything, but because they're desperate for any kind of help at this point. And Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. And then he speaks to the storm just three words. He says to the storm, quiet, be still. Now I can say that to all three of my granddaughters, all five of my granddaughters, nothing ever happens. Jesus says it one time to the storm, and the storm just stopped just like that. Now, if initially the disciples are terrified of the storm, now they just discovered a second reason to be terrified. Now they're terrified of this man, Jesus. Who is this man that with a few simple words, he can calm a raging storm? I know how they felt about Jesus. They were drawn to him and yet frightened of him all at the same time. Did you ever watch little kids at Christmas time? They can't wait to go see Santa Claus until it's actually time to go see Santa Claus. Then they see this large figure with a long white beard, and hey, he, he knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you've been awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. No wonder they cry their eyes out when they have to sit in the old man's lap, right? They're drawn to him, frightened of him, all at the same time. C.S. Lewis understood these kinds of things. In his Chronicles of Narnia, series of books, Aslan the Lion is the hero of the books, and the children are taken by Aslan, because he's their savior, at the same time they're kind of frightened of him because, hey, he's a lion. And if he wanted to, he could tear them limb from limb. And Lewis was fond of saying throughout all seven books that Aslan was not a safe lion, you know. He was good, but not safe. And so now the disciples were discovering that Jesus was not a safe Lord, and they really were in the midst of a dilemma. I mean, first of all, they're terrified of dying in the middle of the storm. It's a basic fear of all of us. We're afraid of losing ourselves before we ever even really find ourselves. And that made them terrified of life and terrified of this Jesus they didn't understand. And here they are absolutely frozen in fear. And I think really for all of us, this is where life begins. Up until this time, you could call it once before a time. From this point on, we could call it once upon a time. The point at which we come to realize life is difficult. Life is hard. Life is problematic. Life, ultimately, is terrifying. What do you do in the face of the terror? 
Well, we don't know yet. We have to go to another boat story to find the answer to that question because it's true. Important lessons are learned in boats. Our second boat story comes from the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus had just fed 5,000 people from a few loaves and fishes. He went up into the mountains alone told the twelve to go back down and cross the Sea of Galilee. And the twelve, as they're going back to the seaside, think, we don't get it, the time was so right for him to proclaim himself the new king of Israel. But they obey him, they get back to the seaside, they look at the boat, they look at the water, they look at the boat, deja vu sets in. But they follow his instruction, head out of the water, and sure enough, again, a terrible storm kicks up. Only this time, there's no Jesus sound asleep in the back of the boat. They look out on the water and a ghost is walking toward them. The ghost speaks. He says, take courage, it is I. Interesting word, courage. I was thought to be courageous meant to step forward without any fear whatsoever. Finally, it occurred to me that's not courage. That is stupidity. Now, courage is stepping forward even though you are absolutely filled with fear. And Peter, rather courageously, thought he'd heard that ghost before. And he said, Lord, if that's you, tell me to walk to you on the water. So Jesus said, um, okay, walk to me on the water. And so Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water. You ever done that? I've never done that. I don't know anybody who's ever done that. Well, no, actually, I take that back. When I was a kid, I grew up in northern Ohio, and we had this church camp called Round Lake Christian Assembly. They called it that because it was a big round lake. And so one night, we're doing a Bible reenactment of this story, and they had a floating dock in the swimming area, and so they filled the ballast of that floating dock with just enough water that the dock sunk down to water level, and so Jesus is walking in the water. It really looked like Jesus was walking in the water. It was so cool. But unfortunately, Jesus couldn't tell where the edge of the dock was. And he fell into the water. And it turned out Jesus didn't swim all that well, so the disciples had to save him. It, you know, the whole thing just was ruined. I've never gotten out of the boat and walked in the water, but Peter did. He got out of the boat. He walked on the water, I know he took his eyes off Jesus, fell into the water, cried, Lord, save me. Ah, I don't care about that. The important point is that he had the courage to get out of the boat and walk on the water in the first place. If the first stage of life is to find out life's terrifying, then Peter just showed us what the second stage of life is. It's learning to take a courageous step forward in the face of your fear. I knew from the time I was three or four years of age, I was transgender. In my naivete and my white male entitlement, I thought I got to choose. I thought a gender fairy would arrive and say, okay, what's it going to be? And of course, I would choose what I knew myself to be, a girl, but alas, no gender fairy arrived, so I just lived my life. I didn't hate being a boy, I just knew I wasn't one. Went to college, got married, had kids, built a career, but the call toward authenticity has all the subtlety of a smoke alarm. And eventually decisions have to be made. And so I came out as transgender and promptly lost every single one of my jobs. I'd never had a bad review. I lost every single job. I lost my pension worth eh, about a million dollars. I'd given half a million dollars to the organization I worked with. They didn't want to give that money back. It had been a loan to them. They did not want to give it back to me. I had to threaten a lawsuit to get that back. You know, in all 50 states of the United States, you cannot be fired for being transgender, but in all 50, you can be fired if you're transgender and you work for a religious corporation. Good to know. It's not easy being a transgender woman. People often ask me, do you feel 100% like a woman? And I say, well, first of all, if you've talked to one transgender person, you've talked to exactly one transgender person. I mean, I can't speak for anybody else. I feel 100% like a transgender woman. There are things a cisgender woman knows I will never know. That said, I'm learning a lot about what it means 
to be a woman, and I'm learning a lot about my former gender. And I'm here to tell you, the differences are massive. Like, I'll start with the little things. The pockets on women's jeans. Someone explained to me they are utterly useless. You can't put anything in there, a paper clip maybe? It's like, seriously? You're gonna, this is it? I bought a pair of jeggings not long ago. They have stitching right here that makes you think there's a pocket, but no, there's no pocket. It's all a trick. You know, I spoke to the Levi's Corporation headquarters in San Francisco last year. I thought, this is great. I'm going to finally find out about the pockets. And so I'm saying, could somebody explain that to me? And they said, oh, yeah, it's just always been that way. I said, well, you know, just because it's always been that way doesn't mean it always needs to be that way. <laughs> or the size of a woman's wardrobe. There's a guy, I had a few pair of jeans, a few pair of khaki pants, a couple of blue sport coats. I mean, really, what do you need? As a woman, I have closets and closets full of clothes. Why? Because, because people will notice if you wear something too often. Well, men won't notice because they're men. But women will notice, and they will judge you for it. Really, they will. Here's a phrase you will never hear spoken to a man. You will never hear anybody say to a man, hey, buddy, that, that is not a good haircut for a guy over 50. Because we don't care if a man looks like he's over 50 or 60 or 70, for that matter. But a woman, ooh, people say, who's your hairdresser? As if to say, do you really even have a hairdresser? And if you do, does she know you're over 50? You know, there's no way a well-educated white male can understand how much the culture is tilted in his favor. There's no way he can understand it because it's all he's ever known and all he ever will know. And conversely, there's no way for a woman to understand that because being a woman is all she's ever known. I mean, she might have an inkling that she's working twice as hard for 80% as much, but she really has no idea how much more difficult life is for her than it is for the guy in the Brooks Brothers jacket in the office across the hall. I know. I was that guy. And it did not take me long to see my power diminishing. So the very first time I ever flew as Paula, I was flying from Denver to Charlotte. And I got on the plane, and there was stuff in my seat. And so I, I picked that stuff up and put, put it down in my stuff down in my seat. And a guy said, that's my stuff. And I said, OK, but it's in my seat. So I'll be happy to hold it for you until you find your seat. And the guy said, lady, that is my seat. I said, yeah, actually, it's not. It's my seat, 1D, but like I said, I'll be happy to hold your stuff for you till you find your seat. He said, lady, I don't know what I need to tell you. That is my seat. I said, actually, it is not. It's my seat, 1D. At which point the guy behind me said, lady, would you take your effing argument elsewhere so I can get in the plane? Only he didn't say effing. He said the real word. I was utterly stunned. Stunned. I had never been treated like that as a man. I can tell you exactly what would have happened. I would have said, excuse me, I believe that's my seat. And immediately, the guy would have looked at his boarding pass because he would have assumed, oh yeah, that's a man. He knows where he's sitting. It must be me who's wrong. I know that because it happened all the time. But since I'm a woman, apparently, how could I know what seat I'm in? And certainly, I don't belong in first class flight attendant, took her boarding passes, and said to the guy, sir, you're in 1C, she's in 1D. I put his stuff down in 1C, I sat down in 1D, not a word from him. And of course, you know who's next to me in 1F, it's Mr. Would you take your effing argument elsewhere. So my friend Karen, who works for American and DIA, came on the plane to give the paperwork to the captain, and she waved as she left. I got to Charlotte, she called me. She said, Paula, what happened? You were as white as a sheet. I told her, and she said, Oh, yeah, yeah, welcome to the world of women. Now, the truth is, I will not live long enough to lose my white male privilege. I brought it with me when I transitioned, but oh, I do see how much things have changed. So, not long after transitioning, I was brought onto the board of a large nonprofit. The nonprofit has a large annual conference every year 
we had a brand new CEO. And we were talking in a board meeting about whether or not to have her give a keynote for the conference. And I said, well, she's not really a seasoned speaker. It might be better if we just interview her. But if you want her to give a keynote, I'm, I'm happy to coach her. At which point, a powerful white male in the room said, well, if we're going to do that, why don't we hire a real coach? Excuse me? I waited for somebody to speak up because I knew a bunch of people knew my background. Nobody speaks up. What I wanted to say was, um, you know, I've done, I've done three TED Talks that have had over nine million views. I'm a coach for TED. I'm a coach for the largest TEDx in North America. I've taught speech in three universities, two in the United States, one in Europe. Tell me, what part of that does not make me a real coach? But instead, of course, I didn't say anything, because if I spoke up, I'd learn by then. Now I'm just that woman. There's one thing I wish I could go back and say to Paul, just one thing. It would be, assume a woman knows what she's talking about and treat her accordingly. I mean, that all by itself would go a long way. Well, that and stop interrupting us. I mean, really, just stop interrupting us. Did you know that men interrupt women twice as, twice as often as they interrupt men? It's not easy being a transgender woman, and particularly right now in today's world. This year, 556 laws were introduced in 41 state legislatures to take away the civil rights of transgender people. 78 of them have been signed into law. Who's driving these laws? You say, well, it's Republican legislatures. And it is Republican legislatures, but it's actually not Republicans per se because 61% of Republicans believe transgender people should have the same civil rights as everyone else. Who's driving these laws? Unfortunately, it's conservative fundamentalist Christians. 87%, 87% of whom believe gender is immutably determined at birth. 67% of whom believe that we already give too many civil rights to transgender people and yet, only 31% of whom actually know someone who is out as a transgender person. We need allies who will speak on our behalf, but we need more than allies. When you're an ally, you're still in charge of what you're saying. We need apprentices who will listen to what we ask them to do, who will speak up on our defense and our behalf. We need people willing to be heroes courageously get out of the boat and walk in the water. Joseph Campbell talks about the hero's journey. The hero's journey is common to every language, every culture, every age, every ethnicity, every people group. It always has the same elements in it. An ordinary citizen is called onto an extraordinary journey onto the road of trials. And initially, they reject that call because, hey, it's the road of trials. Nobody willingly goes on to the road of trials. But now eh, you know you've been called. And that you've rejected the call. And you're miserable because you've rejected the call. And a spiritual guide comes into your life, a Yoda, if you will, who gives you the courage to answer the call under the road of trials. And so you, you answer the call under the hero's journey. And you find yourself, sure enough, on the road of trials. And it's a road of trials. And then things get worse. You find yourself in a deep, dark cave. What Dante was talking about at the beginning of the Divine Comedy was when he said, in the middle of the road of my life, I awoke in a dark wood where the true way was wholly lost. Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's Macbeth, life is but a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. John of the Cross's dark night of the soul. You are completely and utterly and profoundly lost. And this is when you discover that it's okay. It's all right to be lost because, well, lost is a place too. That's right. Lost is a place too. 
And sometimes you got to spend some time in the place called lost. Because there's a wisdom to be gained in the place called lost you cannot gain any other place. A certain wisdom that comes from experiencing the dark night of the soul. And sometimes you'll have to spend a day there or a week or a month or a year. I'm just kind of coming out of another time in the place called lost. It is never fun. It is inevitable for those who are willing to go on the hero's journey. And so once you've discovered lost is a place too, and you've spent the time you need to spend there, finally you see the light at the end of the tunnel, and this time it's not an oncoming train. And so you get back out on the ordinary road of trials, which now feels like nothing, given what you've gone through. And you finally get to the Holy Grail, to the pearl of great price. Only you realize when you get there, that's not really ever been where you were going in the first place. Because now you have a responsibility to take the Holy Grail, bring it back, and give it as an offering to those from whom you have departed. Only then are you free to move on. Now, everyone has been called onto the hero's journey. The question isn't whether you've been called or not. The question is whether or not you will answer the call. And you will always be called to a realm of your giftedness. Now, all of us have three different levels of abilities. First, you have what I will arbitrarily call an ability. An ability is something you're good at, but that you don't really like. Like, I run the books for my own company. I'm good at it. I don't like it. That's an ability. You will not be called to the realm of your ability. You will be called to the realm of your gifts. A gift is something you're good at that you enjoy so much you lose track of time when you're doing it. Or you will be called in the realm of your pinnacle gift. A pinnacle gift is what people most affirm about you. Not, not your parents, not your mom, but what most people you work with that you spend time with affirm about you. Where people say, oh yeah, this is, oh yeah, that's your sweet spot. Yeah, that's your pinnacle gift. You will always be called to the realm of your gift or your pinnacle gift, but it will not be to the obvious spot. If you think to yourself, ah, yes, this is what I've been waiting for. Oh, this is what I want to do. This is my calling. This is my calling. Yeah, that's not your call. That's somebody else's call. Because your call will never be a call to a moment of, oh, joy of joys. Your call will always be a moment of, oh, shh, really? You want me to do that? Because your call will always be terrifying. It will always call you to a place you don't think you have the tools to go. Do you know why? Because you actually don't have the tools to go. You will gain those tools once you answer the call. You'll never gain the tools if you don't answer the call. All of us are called. The question is, will you answer the call? My favorite poet is Mary Oliver. My favorite poem of hers is The Journey. It goes like this. One day you knew what you had to do and began, though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice. One day you knew what you had to do and began, though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice, so the whole house began to tremble, and you felt the old tug at your ankles. Mend my life, each voice cried. Mend my life. But you, you, you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do. Though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations, though their melancholy was terrible. But it was already late enough, late enough, and a wild night, and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, as you left their voices behind, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds and there was a new voice, a new voice, a new voice, which you slowly recognized as your own. That kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life you could save. 
It's time to get out of the boat, answer the call, and walk in the water. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for creating us with the ability to stretch, to reach, with hearts that can hear the stir of your call. Give us the courage to answer the call, to get out of the boat, to walk on the water, to make a difference in the world. For this, we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you. That was, that was phenomenal. Oh, well, thank you. Talk about keeping us light for complete.